My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, a podcast where I, your host, try to give you some tips on how you can explain all this weird, wild, crazy conspiracy stuff to the people you love most, because that's what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years with no success. I've been telling everybody that I give them in a shade. Again, with your, Mark being Mark again. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's the thing about podcasts is when you're on the air, and it's like therapy, you know. If I can't talk to my family about this stuff, I'll talk to you, Matt, and all our listeners. You know, just tell your whole podcast. Yeah. So, who are we talking about today, Matt? Mr. Eeyore Bach, who I had the honor to be spend much time in my life to listen to what he had to say. On this day, he gave one story that his family had passed down in one family from Finland from a time we have no idea about today. The story is based in one linguistic scientific method. There's 29 sounds, and each sound has a mark for the sound and a meaning for the sound. And this whole saga is based around this, what we would call the root alphabet, which the root language came from. All languages on this planet, they all come from 29 sounds. And today I will explain these sounds and the meaning for the sounds. To understand what the sounds really mean, you have to listen to the story that will follow. Because in the story, I will go through these different sounds, these different, and explain what they really mean. This is all still exists today. 50 kilometers is one ring land at the very North Pole, 250 kilometers across. And this is all still exists today. This is where the four corners of the world meet, as they say. It's where the four hemispheres meet right here. In this ring land, in this story, I will explain one family of people, actually two families of people, one group of people called the Osser people. The sound ah, Osser, and Osser are who this family who gave me this story, which I'll explain in the saga how I got this information. The the pole, a masculine symbol, and the dot above the E is the North Star. So if you came straight up from this, you would come to the North Star because the North Star is right above this hole in the middle of this ring of land in Finland. The first sound is E. The next sound is the sound ah. Ah is a clear sound, ah, and ah means the Asa people, because in this story, each sound has a mark, and each mark has meaning to it, logic. So this story is based in one logic and one log. The sound L is L in English and in root language. The next sound is the sound M. We know all too well that history is full of lies, deception, revisions, and so on. And these ancient lines go far, far back. Today, we examine one of these lines. One that the powers that be just don't want us to see. The story of heathen cosmology, Eeyore Bach. Joining us on the show today, Andrew Rouse and Dan Danunaki. 
from the Roots of Creation podcast. I'm your host, Mystic Mark. Thank you for joining us here and enjoy this episode on the Box Saga with the Roots of Creation. There's some Jim Chesner videos where he literally goes to these locations and, of course, have Catholic monuments built on top of them and things like that. You can still see where water supposedly is swirling around and and going downward. That's kind of the toroidal field is kind of part of that origin story. You yeah, know, you what think. makes the energy flow that way? It's Asgard, right? Uh, mm. So the North Pole is Asgard and Gartha, as Gartha, comes from the word Asgard so there's a connection there too with inner earth and Asgard and also the Bifrost bridge was uh, said to have been somewhere near Asgard and they would take that Bifrost bridge and they could were able to teleport to different parts of the world so maybe they're going into the inner earth and coming out in a different location to get there faster Anyways, yeah. here we are with the two thirds of Roots of Creation on the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast. Joachim has a Northern European virus, so we'll f- cross our fingers and hope he's all right. Andy's weathering a storm over there himself, and Dan is duck and cover hiding from exploding underwater volcanoes. Here we are on the My Family <laughs> Thinks Some Crazy podcast <laughs> Sunday morning. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I don't think Duck and Cover is going to help me too much. From an underwater <laughs> volcano? I think you're going to get yeah. swept away in a sea of lava. <laughs> oh, we'll man. be reading about you thousands of years from now when we find your documents. Yeah, we're yeah. going to find him in the, the ash city that will become Portland, Oregon, or wherever Dan is. <laughs> the new Phoenix. <laughs> well, here we are. We're doing a new <laughs> format here. It's called the Cold Rolling. It's where I... Uh, record you guys the whole time and then i pick and choose what i want to edit in and out and then uh, make you guys sound however i want you to sound crazy sane no no. (laughs) just kidding (laughs) no audio foolery going on here folks i promise i just make myself sound smarter i don't touch your guys' sentences or anything. But uh, that's me, always how it goes, right? <laughs> let it's me, always self editing. <laughs> let me in on the magic behind your show. So who 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 came up with this idea? Because I know the box saga was something Dan and I talked about when he was on my show. Uh, yeah. a couple episodes afterwards, Andy joined me on the show. We might have touched on it, Andy. I don't know. I think we spoke about a whole bunch of stuff. It's hard for me to place, but I know Dan and I talked about it. But when did this idea really like blossom into its own show? Me and Yake, after I got in touch with Yake and had him on the show, it was always my goal to have Jim Chesner on the podcast, which is kind of why I started the podcast in the first place and why I started out talking about Box Saga. It's because I found it fascinating and I wanted to connect the dots and I wanted to talk to Jim. And after I got the podcast started, we had done a few episodes. I was trying to find him and I found out that he had passed away and I was, I was really bummed about it. And so I started looking at it on other podcasts to see if I could find somebody else that was talking about the box saga. And I came across Yake who was on uh, chance gardens interverse. And so I had hit up Chance and I was like, hey, man, I really want to talk to Yake. If you could help me out, get his co- with his contact information or anything, I'd appreciate it. And um, like three weeks, a month later, <laughs> he finally got back to me and he was like, here, man. And I was like, oh, fuck, yeah, thank you so much. And I got in touch with Yake. And then I, I was so stoked to like talk to somebody that has uh that he well he knew Jim and and he is really close to the saga so I was really stoked on that and then I guess so what did it for and then we kind of talked Yake talked a little bit about like doing like a 
a show about the saga and like how and doing the oral tradition and everything and podcasting is a perfect place and i was very into it and then i guess we had andy on roots of creation rising rising from the ashes show and we did a swap cast and i told him about the box saga and that and it, i think that kind of flipped him and then he was like dude you're fucking kidding me right now. He's like, all kinds of things are going through my head. And then like a few days later, he's like, dude, we should, we should like make a box saga show. And then immediately Dan was like, well, that's already in talks. <laughs> and I that was like it. the language was what really um, turned me on completely. It was mind blowing what I was seeing in the root language of that the box saga describes. And, and for me personally, on a really weird out there psychedelic level, I had had a really deep psychedelic experience over a decade ago that I came out of talking like a crazy person that no one understood. And I was saying things like, I swear there's some kind of hidden story inside of language itself. And it's connected across all languages and it made no sense. I forgot about it. Everybody else forgot about it. And now here we are learning about this root language and it's, it had, it stood my hair on end and it still hasn't laid back down. I, I think I even remember you relaying that story. And yeah, there is something so enticing about the root language. I can remember where I was when I first heard the Bach saga. It was most likely Jim Chesner talking about it. And it was 100% the higher side chats because that's all I was <laughs> yeah. listening to. But yeah. I also listened to the Grimerica show. So I probably caught that interview with Jim as well. I'm glad you told me that too because I actually asked Darren Grimes for Jim's email and I forgot that Jim had passed away. So rest in peace, Jim, if any of his family members ever check this out, or maybe he hears it from beyond. But there is just something so missing from the European history, and I think this is it. Because when you, like, at least from my perspective, growing up Roman Catholic, going to church, like going to Bible class, CCD, once a week, and learning, like, the flood story and all about all these like Middle Eastern people. I'm like, this is not me. This does not resonate with me at all. Like I'm looking at pictures of dudes that like have like dark black curly beards. I'm like, <laughs> this is not, this is not me. Maybe a little closer about how Dan looks, but not me. And, and you know, I, I just, when I first heard the whole box saga, it just made way more sense. And it kind of fit into some things I heard Matt LaCroix talking about on the tinfoil hat because he came in and dropped the first hammer of the gods with those <laughs> series of episodes. And I just ever since been so fascinated to see where the two meet because I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's a combination of both. And what you have is the the root races of man, you know, all sort of being forgotten and replaced by this one story, this homogenous, oh, we're all created here, when really I don't think it's it's that far-fetched to suppose maybe there were stages of creation where different groups of people were created over time, and then together, since we're not you know totally incompatible with each other, we blended into what we are now. So, yeah, I'm really excited to have you guys here, and also excited to see how Roots of Creation develops, and that's why I wanted to have you guys on the show. Obviously, Yakim couldn't make it here. That's fine. I would have butchered his name a hundred times. We'll get him. <laughs> we'll get him back on in the future. Definitely. But but you know, I think it's really cool that you guys have taken this torch and said like, let's examine this further. It, it's awesome that there are that many people in Europe interested in it because I feel like in America we're kind of in this little fringe area with this subject where it seems like. It feels like a biker gang, <laughs> pagan like thing, you know, which is fine. <laughs> Nothing against that. But I feel like that's maybe uh, been demonized by those groups who get associated with more extreme ideologies, which mm -hmm. this ideology is not extreme whatsoever. I mean, it's a, it's just a creation story, which we can find those on all corners of the globe. Right. I mean. Sure. I was just going to say real quick, it's it's also, it's unfortunate too, because in this story that we can tell about Box Saga, it's again, as always, the Catholic Church that is the bulldozing factor. And all these 
weird phobias of the pagan and heathen world were dictated to the populace by that bulldozing Catholic church that most of the truth community, despite their fears about this heathen culture, seem to agree about the Catholic church. Yeah. So it's very, very oxymoronical, unfortunately. Right. And I think this is a topic that doesn't just limit itself to the box saga by any means, but I think the saga and the root language ha- could be a very important key in kind of putting those things to rest. If we're talking about logic and reason and we want to eventually come to a settling point with each, with everyone and kind of understand what was really going on. And we need to throw out a lot of our old dualities that we kind of have come to rely on. Yeah. I was going to say it's a very human story too. It's Mm. about humanity. It's not about angels or demons or, or aliens or any of that shit. It humanizes the creation story and that's kind of what's fascinating about it. And also it's telling the other perspective of what happened in history. It's the second story that we don't get to hear. It's the other, you know, the other side's story. There's always two stories to everything. Right. And so I think for a long time, people have never heard this one and that's what makes it so amazing to me. Right. Well, even the point of, you know, on the the point of the Catholic Church, if you think about the story, for those who don't know, centers around Helsinki, Finland, or at least maybe like the ancient version of where that place is now. But you just look, like you said, root words, hell, Helsinki. Mm -hmm. What did the Catholic Church, you know, deem the worst place in the world? Hell, I don't think right. that's a coincidence. You know, they didn't just like pick that word for, you know, it, because it had E-L in it. You know, it's right. it's like yeah. there is something there. It's sort of like flipping in, or inverting that we hear yes, a lot about. The, in, the inversion continues because it was the coldest place. Mm, <laughs> not, right. not the not down low, up high, you know, in the north. Right. And hell also means completion and home. Or heaven. It's it's all mm. of these things. It's very weird. <laughs> and then devil means wheel, circle. Mm. Yeah. Now, Which, and then you look at angel and it means angle or circle. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so or, Ouroboros is the wheel. Mm. Now, I think it's important because a, a lot of people, you know, will cite this kind of thing within the conspiracy speculative you know alternative community of research right they'll use root words and usually it goes Mm -hmm. either to latin it goes to maybe hebrew but it's very rare that you see people taking this angle on examining the root words but do you guys have maybe some more examples of some words beyond hell that folks would recognize that has this sort of a northern european or box saga root because i think that helps folks really uh understand the full picture and how much influence this northern european culture has had over western culture despite not being remembered for that whatsoever i mean i i like i said i heard about this on a podcast conspiracy podcast of all places this is something maybe you'd expect to learn in history class i mean it really it goes deep Mm, and i and we want to get some legitimate etymologists and linguists on our show as well who Mm. have bathed in these sciences for decades you know what i mean Um, now dan do you have some good examples off the top of your head because right now on the show we're trying to get people on that have been close to the box saga to let them tell their stories so that we can try to fill this box saga out more through the oral tradition mm-hmm. and then we want to be able to get those different people on and start proving different things right so that's down the road but right now we're just trying to get those stories out i mean there's there's a lot of words i mean just raw for example comes from box saga and uh, ball comes from box saga. The Baltic is pretty much the sea that they're sitting in. And then when you go to ball back, ball bach sounds exactly similar to that, right? And that's the temporal of, of Jupiter. And where is that, Turkey or something? So- I don't know if, if one of you guys sent me this, but I have, a, I think it's like a, 
a PDF of the box saga with some more words. Maybe oh, I can jump in with yeah. some too, Dan, and you can pass yeah. some back. So miss story, mystery, miss story. And I know that's a big component of the box saga is this like feminine and masculine balance, right? Because yes. you see this, especially in the Catholic dichotomy it's like you'll have saints and you'll have virgins but you won't have like you know a married couple for whatever reason right there's no like <laughs> figures at joseph and mary but that's it like you know it's just kind of odd but and joseph is just like mentions mo more focus on mary mm, right right and everything in box like the knowledge passed down is matriarchal it's it's from the woman that passes down the yes. wisdom ironically and it's what are the two names uko for the man and uh, and aka for the woman yeah who is the knowledge giver and when you look at aka you can find academic and academy you know that series of words what else akashic record akashic record and yeah. then people pi pole pole being the north pole mm -hmm. pi being a circle <laughs> yeah and wow. think of pole land too pole land right. the land right. from the pole a lot of the words like coming upon these weird syn synchronistic words and things in the root language it's it's easy to to just start by telling kind of some of the history of the box saga about like Atlantis instead of Atlantis, which is supposedly mm -hmm. from the box saga standpoint, a time period of ice. Right. So like basically the ice age and you find that all of the Northern hemisphere would have been under this ice age anyway. So it kind of fits the geographical locations that we suppose Atlantis would have been. So this is perhaps just describing groups of people during this time period, this alt Lantis period. Yeah. I'm very, very excited to see if, if, you know, obviously folks can go to Eeyore box telling Jim Chester's retelling, but as this story passes on, you know, I'm hoping, you know, you guys add, something to the mix maybe even someone will come along and turn this into a documentary or a movie if it's not already right. one you know or Possibly at least you yes. know <laughs> add it to like give some visual elements to it because yeah when you start to see how the words connect it really does put it in a full picture i'm wondering you know you, you mentioned that you want to get some more academic types do you think that these folks are familiar with this story do you anticipate maybe getting into debate with some of these folks because of that because i feel like this is something that it's not like it's not that well known enough for people to hear it and be like oh that's bullshit you know like you have mm -hmm. enough leeway to give somebody like a pretty good explanation for it and maybe that can cut past like the kind of thing that maybe a flat earther might run into when they when they're trying to make their argument against somebody who's more mainstream you know i feel like this isn't quite loaded as much as some other conspiracy histories might be I think too much of the box saga actually adds up, but there's th that a lot of the down to earth stuff that we can really play with and, you know, professional academics would take seriously. It's right alongside a lot of very controversial, very taboo and very suggestive ideas. I mean, the aspect of the Atlantis time period and all that, the, the hist the, the ancient history of the box saga, it's, it's in a way it's just as uh, anecdotal as any other creation story. So, I mean, we have to rely on where this language ends up eventually. And I think if we can get people to focus on the, the, the real analytical stuff, then we have a chance to kind of sidestep a lot of the, the more intense aspects of the saga that, you know, say a linguist may not have to deal with directly, you know? Right. Well, this is the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. So if you had to, <laughs> if you had to like maybe, and you know, sell someone on it in a few points and you only had a few points, I know this isn't an ideal circumstance. I don't encourage the listeners to go and do that, but it is helpful. What, you know, what are the, some of the talking points that are most compelling to you? Like if you had to convince someone who is kind of on the fence, what would you tell them? 
Dan, you want to kick that off? I tell them, you know, the alt lances thing definitely is a huge thing because you can kind of see how the Atlantis thing would make sense. And when everybody talks about a lost civilization, they always refer back to Atlantis. And it seems like, you know, in history, all these civilizations sprouted up with like already crazy knowledge. Like how do you just sprout up with all this knowledge? Like you should have been doing little huts and figuring stuff out. And there should be all kinds of, transcriptions on cave walls about trying to figure out how to add and stuff. And you just don't see that you see what you see is like pictographs and rock carvings already dedicated to these people that are teaching them these things. Right. (laughs) Right. So it's like it happened to have come from somewhere. Even Graham Hancock talks about this civilization that we have seemed to have forgot about, you know, so at the Atlantis, Atlantis aspect is uh, pretty compelling. The whole like really creation part is compelling too with the paradise and the paradise, which is when before the earth tilt and then they say the tilt is what caused the ice age. So that's another uh, interesting aspect. When, once you really get down into it though, you see that this kingdom that they lived in, which was Atlantis, had they talk about the concentric circles they and they talk about you know sending people out from this area of the north and to the different caste systems and when you think about like the caste systems and satan getting cast out of hell or whatever or cast out from heaven the heavens which is the North. And you always hear stuff like they came down. That's in Zachariah Sitchin's book. A lot is they came down from everybody assumes the sky, but I think it was, heaven. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In heaven. the Sumerian story, it's, you know, those that descended from heaven. And yeah. Do you, do, is your audience familiar with that? Kind of the creation story of the box hug, or should we kind of get into it for them? I definitely want to get into it, but before we get away from my screen share, I brought this up just to make a point. And if folks yeah. are listening or watching, rather, they can maybe see why I'm illustrating this point. So, see this field, right? The toroidal field, and like mm-hmm. what's going on on the bottom where the, the field is moving into the center and then out the other side. Mm-hmm. So, yes. imagine the earth the South pole would be the top area that we're looking at. And the North pole would be the bottom area. And this process is happening over like long, long periods of time. So it's not moving nearly as fast as it is in this diagram here. But if, you know, with that trajectory, I could imagine Europe and Norway and those Northern European areas possibly being further South in the middle of the Atlantic ocean. And then over time, you know, with a cataclysm coming in conjunction, sort of moving up into a colder area, who knows? Maybe that's connected to the Atlantis all land ice theory. Just kind I of love the toroidal here. field, man. The toroidal right. field fits perfectly with a lot of what's said in Box Saga because the Box Saga says that in that area, in hell, in the north, when when Helsinki was the North pole, that there was a vortex, that there was some kind of underground. They could even live in these, these areas, but overall it was a, it was a vortex that went Mm. all the way down. And, uh, you know, there's some Jim Chesner videos where he literally goes to these locations that of course have Catholic monuments built on top of them and things like that. You can still see where water supposedly is swirling around and, and, going downward the story unless we i don't know if we want to get into that yet the 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 actual origin of it but that's kind of the toroidal field is kind of part of that origin story you know what makes the energy flow that way it's asgard right uh Mm. so the north pole is asgard and gartha as gartha it comes from the word asgard so there's a connection there too with inner earth and asgard and also the Bifrost Bridge was uh, said to have been somewhere near Asgard and they would take that Bifrost Bridge and they could 
were able to teleport to different parts of the world. So maybe they're going into the inner earth and coming out in a different location to get there faster. It doesn't really talk like that's what they do. I'm just uh, spitballing right there. But Well, for, for the listeners, and you may already know this, Dan, but there are several stories of people visiting the hollow earth. The most famous is Admiral Bur- Admiral Byrd in the South Pole, but there is a, a book called like the smoky face of God or something like that about, I think they're either Norwegian, Swedish, or Finnish. One of those three, sorry folks in those countries for generalizing, but someone from your area took a boat with their father into the entrance of the North Pole. So there are stories and, you know, that book is billed as fiction nowadays, but when it came out, it was not intended to be a fictional tale. So that's very, you know, interesting that, yeah, we have kind of experiences, witness experiences of this hollow earth from both ends. It's weird too that Hyperborea, I've mentioned this on a couple shows, that Hyperborea is another interesting tale about the North Pole, but instead of a vortex, it's a mountain, a magnetic mm. mountain. I don't know if there's inversion there or or what's going on, but it's interesting that it's the exact opposite of the saga's take on the North Pole, you mm. know? Undoubtedly. But it also includes islands surrounding that vor- that area, that mag- that magnetic mountain. So it's similar too. Could have been a different period in time or something like that right that it was that it was around yeah it's i mean there's so much to the whole story when you're asking about language earlier just the letter v Hmm. sounds kind of weird but it means like uh, the the vaughn or the vanir and uh, you can see the v pop up in the fronts of different word like vishnu or viking or i mean i don't I can't think of another one off the top of my head, but you'll start to notice it. <laughs> yeah. That's all well, I'll say. You'll and start even the to V notice itself, that. the I always say the the because the box saga's root language is anatomical and it's everything is named very purposely on multiple levels, and V being this divergent shape, right? And the story from the box saga's perspective about the Vikings themselves are the two brothers, Fen and Dan, heading away to form Sweden and Denmark, and the two the Viking system. The by vi, I I I see the yeah. v and b exchanged in many languages, and right. we can see that that means two. Yeah, I mean that mm. makes much more sense than what Wikipedia tells us the <laughs> answer for the word Viking is. You know, obviously they obscure things with Latin and whatnot, but. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it I all think. comes from Latin. Always. You can't find it. It all just roots back to Latin, according to, to mainstream well, sources. Th- this does this does say that there is sort of a dispute, which usually when you find that in mainstream sources, it probably lends credit to a company, you know, where they're like, oh, let's not let this knowledge out because it opens up a whole can of worms but it says that yeah the origin of weising or viking is dis- disputed and they have it spelled with the w here but very mm-hmm. interesting yeah and it it's also says it occurs on some very old swedish rune stones as well so i think that's where the some of the dispute is is because they're like hey 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 this whole, this word goes way further back, you know, oh, like yeah. throw your paper books away. This shit's written in stone. <laughs> There's another conundrum that Dan and I and Yake have gotten into, and we've actually had a couple different perspectives given to us. The idea of the Nephilim from the, you know, Persian Gulf religions. I've heard this, and, the Nephilim, right? And that, Nephilim, which is the land of the dead. It's a very important part of Norse land culture, of and land of the mist. So, right. I mean... We've had a number number of explanations. I mean, no one has really come out and basically highlighted the weirdness of, you know, it's again, we have Atlantis or Altlantis, which is a place or a time period. That's the confusion. And then with this, we have Nephilim, a place versus Nephilim, a group of individuals. It's a very weird, you know, the way this has transformed or skewed is, is very strange. I can't make heads or tails of it yet, but it's a very, it, I think it says something because we're talking about Norse gods here. I think, I really do think we're talking about this, these sets of 
northern people, these arctical people right. that had, were coming south. I mean, regardless of whether we're talking about, you know, Nordic culture or we're talking about this Nephilim, Nephilim group. Right. Yeah. Thinking about that too, like Noah's Ark. And then what's interesting is it's Noah and his three sons. Right. And then in this, in this box saga story, it's, it's more about these three sons, but the two that split. And then the third one that goes into Russia. And it's also about three sons. And so is it the, the Ark in that sense, or is it that they came from the Ark, which was a place and not a, like a ship or a boat? Mm. Mm. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's very interesting because Egypt gets so much credit for a lot of this. But when you look at it, the stories kind of exist with similar characters, as you're putting it, you know, Atlantis, you know, the Atlanteans are sort of, Everybody says, oh, well, what if that was the pharaoh, the pre-pharaoh culture, you know, that built the, the pyramids? They were also part of Atlantis, right? But, you know, given that, you know, plate tectonics has been kind of proven, we know that there's such thing as continental drift to some degree. Maybe these places have shifted over time, thus like, you know, and also given what Graham uh, Hancock and Randall Carlson have found, there's a lot of evidence to show that there was much more ice on the planet up in those regions and in North America. So who knows the way we map it out right now could be skewed or maybe the world's just changed. But I think there's something, there's something key with the maps and it's not quite present here as much as it is in the Tartaria talk. Cause you have all these, you know, recently made maps of Tartaria with Tartaria on the, actual map but in this case we have the vinland map which again has that v something that i found in a bookstore in and kind of connected loosely to tartari so i'm wondering you know if that holds any significance but i'm also kind of just rambling here so <laughs> and what, you you heard of that because i brought it up on your show dan but but anything come up to connect like north america in this whole persuasion or no I would say language wise right with the English language, but I'm not sure about that angle. I'm not familiar with that map either. The mm -hmm. Vinland map. They well, say the Vikings were in Minnesota, right? Right. Uh, if you, if you look at the layout of the, if you're fr at the North, you can kind of take any kind of route that you want into these different lands. It's a very short distance. They also talk about like the Vikings or these North people having these long ships that were the best ships ever and the, they talk about the Egyptians having the greatest ships too, but where did they get that tech, technology from? And then you have them selling these different rivers and streams and lakes and everything into different places. That's why they're in Minnesota, you have the whole Viking thing is because they came in through Canada and, or in through the great lakes on the, on the coastlines and then in, into the interior that way. So, so, yeah, I, I think they could have possibly been in North America. I mean, when you think about the, all the stories of the big giants that were here in North America, I mean, where did they come from? Maybe they were the first peoples on, on the planet and they just inhabited everywhere. Right. Or, it's or like maybe, a full, full court press. You have in Europe yeah. the suppression from the Catholic Church, and then as soon as all these Europeans get to America, what do they do? They hide all the giant stuff, you know, and we have stories from Native Americans of big, giant, red-haired people. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I feel like this is kind of, the box saga is kind of filling in some pieces that I think people are finding with the Tartaria conversation in yeah mind yes. you know like they're going to this information yes. and being like oh it's more evidence of tartaria but because box saga hasn't been at equally you know raved over in the past year it people aren't like connecting those dots when maybe because you you talk about this sort of northern european connection and then you look at norumbega which apparently was where washington dc is now it was this like swedish you know building this huge almost looks like the capitol building itself they say used to be norumbega you know and again these these words 
are Northern European. They're not like, you know, <laughs> they're not like Egyptian. They're certainly not, you know, Native American, Norumbega, but, and they're not Russian either. You know, it just, it's very clearly Swedish there. So I'm not trying to like pin it all on Vikings, but I think that's just what the evidence kind of points to when you have this in your like wheelhouse of choices as well. I think Box Saga also can have a way to, to take some of these lesser ideas that are going on right now and kind of put a focus on them. Like the idea that there's some controversy about the slave trade and, and Africans coming over from, from Africa. And I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of accounts posting videos with evidence of, you know, natives being, you know, very African looking, no matter where the natives are. And box saga suggests that every one of us across the whole planet were, were uh, tropical races. And so that once this ice age happened, that was kind of like the split where the white race may have come from was, you know, the same way that it happens to animals in the North possibly happened to us. And they say that we're still technically in that alt Lantis, that there's supposedly no ice on the planet according to box saga when there, when the ice age isn't occurring, it's, a completely different idea. Right. I wonder if, you know, going to this, this is kind of a wild speculation, but going to the hollow earth model, I wonder if the water kind of recedes inside of the planet and then maybe like bubbles up in these like frozen poles. Like the poles are seem maybe like clogged. Like the, it's so cold that like the right. water that would be mm, flowing, wound. you know, through is like now that. like blocked up and frozen because you know we're tilted away from our natural access the sun isn't shining light directly on the north pole like it should and you know because it's tilted away from the sun i mean i could be totally wrong i'm not an astronomer here folks but you sound like, like a stupid fucking uh <laughs> round earther though well you know that's that's gonna happen look at the globe behind me <laughs> with the sea world hat on on the globe nonetheless but you know i think that 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 makes a lot of sense when we think about the precession of the equinox what we're told about the yeah. tilt of the earth like what if you know the water's supposed to flow through this hollow area but because the sun's not warming it up periodically it's blocked up and frozen and and possibly these big pyramids going all around the equator of the earth what if they had something to do with that what if you know unintentionally that system failed and it caused the planet to you know get thrown off its axis or even more nefariously what if there was a dispute between maybe like the Atlantis people and whoever remained in the you know warm regions and this caused some sort of war and, and resulted in a cataclysm well, we could definitely connect the, that idea to the fall that we're all familiar with. Right. You know, we can bring it back to the devil story, too, about, you know, what this possible conflict might have been. Because doesn't, Dan, you could probably clarify a little more that the the idea of blending with the tropical races once they came out of the ice. So the, the, let's set this up that. The, the story is that these people were trapped in the north, but surviving and thriving because of specific weather conditions. For instance, the, the Gulf Stream supposedly kept this area of quote unquote hell unfrozen and able to be habitable compared to the rest of the northern hemisphere, where these people just lasted for millions of years hypothetically, creating and innovating. And then they were to come out of the north and then this this divergence happens this the nephilim story it's the blending with the tropical races out of the ice mm -hmm. seems to be this massive conflict and i've connected it to even romeo and juliet you know the the archetype of it at least you know yeah feuding families because people get confused about the whole satan thing and how satan is or lucifer is the child of god and then, you know, he's beautiful and all this stuff. And, and then, then he wants to like take over everything and, and have his own kingdom. And it seems like you kind of have, you kind of have that story in here also mm. where 
where Satan is the creator, which would be like Odin. And then you have Ra, which is the kingship. Right. And they kind of want to become kings. So another part of that aspect isn't necessarily just uh, hybridization, but also the fact that this king, the first son, they weren't supposed to be mating at all. The mating process was for the last son. The last son was the Bach son and the representation of the sun. And the first son was the king and the representation of the moon. So, so I've heard some people say that sun and sun don't mean the same thing, but even from Bach saga, they're telling you that the last son is the progenitor and the sun is his representation and the sun is the progenitor of life in the world. So that's why the last son is the progenitor also of life and has the children. And so the first son is supposed to be the king, the moon and have kingship over everything. And he's not supposed to be a progenitor. And that changes when this so-called Nephilim story happens and Satan comes down with his people and they all start having sex with all these women because they weren't supposed to be having sex before. They were just givers in the, in the offering system. Right. Hey, I just thought of this. What if nepotism comes from, the, from Nephilim? Because I mean, <laughs> think about it. That's literally what the original system was avoiding was nepotism mm. because nepotism. The, the, the king could not, you know, have his lineage right. and, mm-hmm. and gee, yep. what a surprise that that, is what changed everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that, you know, this is kind of like for anyone familiar with comparative mythology, this is a common theme that you see around yeah. the world. When you look at creation stories is stories of, you know, father, son, brother, mother, you know, and all these different archetype figures. And what I'm hearing with this story is that this term brother and kind of, you know, Osiris and Seth come to mind for me when I think of mythological brothers. But you see this division or this fight, this feud between those who are related, right? That's the whole mm-hmm. concept of this, this yeah. what we're getting at here, where there might have been this war in ancient times between two cultures that were once one culture. Yeah. I mean, you get this with the Atlantean War, too, in the Greeks, right? I think it's like in Plato or whatever where that one dude from Egypt is telling him, like, you guys are so stupid, you don't even realize that you come from the Atlanteans. <laughs> yeah. Your, well, your he culture was... is so far removed that you don't even realize where your actual origins are and you're fighting against your own fucking people, you dumb, stupid motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, he was like, you have the, the knowledge so of children or, or something like that. Yeah, it was yeah. very, very telling for the the wisest you know one of the most cited people in classical (laughs) academia plato and all the others and this guy solon's like yeah you and your homeboys ain't got shit you know and like think about that and you know in context of what's going on in university i mean people are studying these people as if they're the greatest thinkers of our time and it, you know, in their own time period, they were, you know, according to this guy Solon, who speaks very intelligently, you know, very, very unwise and very, very disconnected from their history. And I think that's why Tartaria, Bach Saga, and all of these really interesting dives into history, alternative history, have become so popular because people are not. We're not disconnected entirely. And I think our spiritual intuition kind of is like buzzing when we hear about this stuff. You know, we're like, oh, oh, yeah, this is our story, you know, and like something inside of us wants to connect with that again. But because we've been given this middleman narrative from the churches, you know, we're all kind of felt empty or left feeling empty and then they give us this like half you know fake version of of the story to to fill that in it doesn't quite satisfy it but you guys mentioned maybe we can get into this story obviously you know eeyore and jim are are no longer with us so why not let's get into it can i can i butt in for a second before you get into this next part yeah Um, because when we were talking about the polls right and you mentioned how they might be clogged. And I, I 100% agree with that. And I, I think that we even get a Bible narrative from that perspective too. And that is the fact 
that in Bach saga, they believe that you would be burned and buried with a tree, but your soul would go into the hell hole. It would go in and be recycled and come back out. Kind of the animation that you showed was the energy flowing out and then in. But I think it's kind of, it's uh, actually the opposite and it actually goes in through the top and out through the bottom. Well, yeah, that's, and, that's why I said, okay. imagine it upside down. Cause yeah, yeah I, I think okay, the yeah. North pole is, is like you said, going inward and the South pole comes, whatever comes out. Cause you could yeah. see that with the scientists plate tectonic, what do they call it? Models on what, yes. you know, the Pangea looked like in relation to what it looks like now. So the whole idea was that when you die, your soul which was in your head. That's what the the thinking of it is. I, I read, listened to a book on audio of Andrew Collins, and I forget the name of the... the Denisovian Origins? Cygnus, the Cygnus Key. Cygnus Key. And he's talking about how in ancient civilizations, you see people holding heads. That's like, that's like saying, I got your soul, your soul. I have cut your soul off from you. And so the reason why they're doing that is so they couldn't, take their soul to the hellhole anymore. But by doing that, you ended that person's whole life in, instead. So that's kind of the symbolism in that. And so your soul would go into the top of the pole and then it would come back out through the toroidal field, through the bottom. And that's kind of like the reincarnation process and your soul would be reborn. And so you get people talking about your soul being trapped here now on the planet. And it's because those holes are clogged. And so now your soul has nowhere to go. And I think that's why we get the difference in, in burning bodies and then burying bodies. And then the Pharaohs were all, you know, mummifying bodies for the afterlife is because they're waiting. They're trying to preserve the body because they're waiting for the holes to open back up so that way their souls could go back through the process. I lo- oh my God. I love that. I think that that's that's the missing key, you know. I, I think that's pretty genius. I know it's all, you know, wild speculation to some, but this really hits a lot of keys for me, Dan, what you just put together I, there. I mean, I, it's it is speculative, but it's also based on on right. stories from from the saga and from other external knowledge that people are also talking about and i'm kind of right. putting them together and trying to figure it out in right. a deeper sense right 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 and i am 100 percent behind you in that effort because you know that resonates with me pretty deeply and it makes sense i mean if we look at the way the earth works i mean this is just all fresh on my mind because i've been kind of studying you know ley lines and the layers of the earth and whatnot and the more i look into it the more i find that our earth is a living moving growing changing being and it would make sense that there is some kind of like soul recycling process uh, on an energetic level, I mean, because it's generating our soul somehow or whatever. Energy. We're, yeah, whatever it created, is. Not destroyed. Yeah. Jeez, man. All right. So so let's give people <laughs> let's give people the true the true mythology. The well, let's see, there's a proper word for it. I have it in front of me somewhere. The V what is it? Vinamonin mythology. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So in the very beginning. And Dan, fill in what I what I forget. That's why the, the saga is so vast, you know. But in the beginning... Yeah, we kind of have to be like uh, Jehovah Witnesses and do <laughs> two by two. Uh, 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 you uh, show up you at my door. It <laughs> it's, better, it's better because I think it helps keep the story straight. Uh, somebody else can correct if they know something different. Uh, yes. Because I think it's very important to keep the oral tradition the way that it's supposed to be. And... So, you know, when we go back and we hear things and we make mistakes, we're like, oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, so Especially it's, pronunciations, because that's yeah. key. That's the whole point of the oral tradition, <clears throat> because as soon as the white, the black ink can hit white paper, pronunciations can change and the original meaning of the words change. And that's you lose the script. Babylon, but, um, right? Babylon. As soon as we started writing shit down, everything got changed. Mm. Yeah. So... The, the mythology starts with the sun, which is Odin. And from there, 
what is it that there's two there's a monkey and a goat that mate and create us is it just like that yeah something like that it's yeah. so that's the weird so think about it every religion has its quirky unprovable point and that's kind of where this is it's this very bizarre idea of a goat and an ape combining to make us mm. which when you start to think about all the old you know the horn symbolism everywhere it's it's unbelievable i mean and we could th- we'll probably think of them as time goes on well, all and the little anecdotes about and this is written that. in a time when they weren't aware of things like gene splicing things like dna itself so maybe those were the only terms they could convey to describe something like a genetic experiment right so i mean and and if you look at, i mean I'm not a farmer, folks, but I spend some time on a farm. Let's just say that. And goats are incredibly, incredibly like aware. Like if you walk up to a goat, if you walk up to a goat pen, you have like 50 eyes on you immediately. And they're all like, you know, like they're very social. They're very connect. And they do give you this kind of feeling. Maybe I'm just a strange cat, but but yeah, goats are, are definitely a symbolic <laughs> occult for sure. But also on a real, real, they're like, you know, kind of sweet. And like, they really have this quality to hooved animals that not all hooved animals have. Like cows, they can give a fuck about you. In most cases, they're just like, whatever, you know, but goats seem to be very, very social. Yeah, that's interesting. And a monkey too. I mean, that's just a no brainer there, folks. Right. <laughs> So the then this fuck everything. Right, exactly. So <laughs> therefore it must have happened. Well, so the first two humans talked about are Frey and Freya, which are Freya is at least a goddess in Norse mythology. I don't know how far Frey went. Dan might be able to to fill in on that, but Well the word Friday comes Eve. from from Freya. Yes, absolutely. And Thor's Day. And I don't know how many people know about Wednesday, which is Woden, what, when, Wo, Odin's Day. And so that comes from the Norse as well. But, so, yeah, you have these two individuals and the the knowledge of Odin. Dan, you might have to fill in right here. This is where I'm a little fuzzy. I'm a little fuzzy here, too. <laughs> Yake, feel better. Uh, this is where Yake comes in for he because he knows everything back, backwards and forwards. Basically, what uh, they're talking about is how the, the knowledge of the sun, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the source is in them as well. Mm-hmm. And right. Yeah. And the sperma. This is where you get the d- distinction from the sperma and what's the other one? The embla? Embla. Yeah. So the is animals, what the animals, animals have, have embla and sperm yeah. is from the humans. And so this the idea is kind of like a photosynthesis in a way. Is like the the sun is going in the plants, right? And it's absorbing the sun and it's and it's producing fruits. And the same is said, like with the humans, is like we're taking in the sun and we're producing fruits, which is our children's or our kids, which is also like a baby goat. Right. So <clears throat> so you have right. you have kind of that idea where the sperm is is giving life and it comes from the sun. And that's why they were doing this offering system of consuming their own sperm because it was innately healing their own body and like almost like sending it back to default and taking away all the other things that were wrong with it. And in the, in episode three of roots of creation, you hear Ananto talk about how he had like this disease before he started drinking his own sperm. And then after that, he, his disease completely went away and he, everything was great and he felt so much better. And that's what really got him deep down into the saga is because it, it healed him physically. You also have these myths of, of people living a long time. All the, all these Kings, the kingship all had these long, long lives. We also so, have to consider the Asian side of it, the, the Eastern traditions 
of, you know, there's certain sexual practices where you're conserving the sperm. You're not ejaculating when you're reaching orgasm. Centric sex. Now, yeah, they don't go into the actual drinking of it, but actually I have heard that there is Eastern myths about the auto fellatio as well. Right. So it's there in one form or another. It's this, you know, holding the sperm to be sacred. Which no is fat, interesting no in modern vendor. society. We always hear, us guys always hear that the sperm does nothing, that it, it drops off just a tiny little dot of DNA and the egg and the female does everything else. And, and maybe that's just the paradigm we're in. <laughs> maybe that's science just kind of being, uh, ignoring this. I, I don't, I don't know, but it is popular to just think that we do no almost no part of it whatsoever so that's yeah. a weird inversion of that part of it but so this society kind of lived within this means of procreation this this system is created that dan was going into where the last son was the one that produced the children and this was happening across these concentric ringlands basically in the north right dan up in Udenma. Yeah. And if you ever seen the show Avatar The Last Airbender, they go to a place called Boxing Se. And interestingly enough, in Box Saga, there's this thing called Boxing Day. <laughs> and that is like they have these festivals and carnivals and shit. And this is kind of where like men start to become like gladiators and they're fighting each other for this kind of like survival of the fittest in a way. And whoever wins these battles gets to go on to have sexual relations and produce a child with the most beautiful woman. And so you have you have these ideas already boxing. They would fight each other, punch each other in the face. That's where possibly the word boxing comes from. And, and so they did all these different types of games and everything kind of like what we have with like reality TV game shows and stuff like that. They're all competing to be the best. And the winner of that just gets to fuck the hottest chick, I guess. It's kind of the same. Well, it's now, kind of the same idea when you put it that way. Well, yeah, and I mean, considering what everyone <laughs> says about Christmas being pagan or even Roman, and then you look at the day after that in Canada is called Boxing Day. I mean, it's yeah. not totally forgotten in the modern England. England has it too, right? I just saw that in the in the in the, in the news article. Yeah, like like last month because it was Christmas time. They said they're. They weren't going to close down for Boxing Day in in England. And I was like, oh, there's another fucking connection. <laughs> right, right. Now I think it's mostly for for shopping in uh, like Australia and, and, and UK. But it was originally a holiday intended for people to give, you know, maybe if they got a lot of gifts, you know, give gifts to the lesser fortunate in the community or just like, you know, give charity to people who didn't have a good Christmas, right? So that, that was kind of the idea, but that's totally, I mean, <clears throat> up in the air, up for debate, considering well, the, charity, the, the yeah. charity in the box saga would be the semen. Mm, yep. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> You'd be donating your seed to the, to the, to the greater good. <laughs> yeah. To the greater good. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> basically they were, still isolated from the rest of the world though were they not in, in the odin North? ma yeah odin this is ma, like the around like paradise time still yeah at, we're talking the garden Atlanta. of heathen or eden or even in ice time when they're isolated in ice olation right wow yeah yeah and it says here i found this on eorbach.com it's the seems like the box saga in a pdf form so i definitely encourage people to check this out and read it along with us here but yeah the Udenma the center of Udenma was hell which means clear home complete and that's hell spelt with one l mm -hmm. and the humans healthy right yeah healthy so yeah healing i mean yeah it's definitely another word where you can find a lot of connections and then like i said earlier people and all knowledge could be understood within the pole and ring it is significant to note that mathematics is based on a one and a zero a pole and a ring right so there's another right. you see the <laughs> pi and then the pole right so 
and they go into how they form their mathematics. If you listen to our second episode on Roots of Creation, I believe Michelle Merle goes into a little bit of the, the pole and ring origin of mathematics and geometry. It's, yeah, it's pretty all encompassing there. So the language is from the pole and the ring also. Mm. Well, and, and the language is also the way Michelle describes it. They started naming body parts and, and things like that first. What was in their immediate, I, it's, it seems such like a natural system, you know, again, without any egoic guidance behind it, it's what might naturally come to us almost. But, but yeah, so it goes on like that for thousands and thousands of years where this family system is set up. The original family was called Pirouette, Correct. Dan, was that the name of the original family? Or I don't know where yeah, that name comes so. from, but the <clears throat> interesting the when you look at the move, the the ballet move, a pirouette, it's it's basically a pole spinning around a circle. You know, eventually, <laughs> should we one. skip to ice ball, time? Where ballerina? Ball. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's so many different parts of this that poke. Or up even you let's just story. go to the ball, right? I mean. It's- you yeah. know, without ballerinas, exactly. people go to the ball to dance. It's interesting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Baldur's Gate. Yeah. So then ice time, should we get to this, this uh, cataclysm? Well, the, so that's the first Ragnarok when the earth tilts. Mm-hmm. And, and that word, of course, follows right into Norse mythology. They just kept that word with it. And so, yeah, when ice time happens, Helsinki is no longer where it was in the north. And so hell has sunk, I guess, right? Hell sinks. And so it sinks to the south. And a massive ice wall forms basically around that whole area where these people are because of the Gulf stream and it's keeping them warm and, and they're able to survive in these subterranean, probably part of the vortex if it was real in these subterranean areas. And they supposedly gained lighter skin and blue and green eyes, blonde hair, red hair, things like that. Can I just stop you for a second? I mean, oh, considering, means- considering what, we just talked about with comparative mythology and and also you know the idea that the bible is recycled stories rewritten for a new culture taken mm-hmm. from older cultures and you know a lot of flat earthers happen to be christian they find these things these references to the ice wall could that all just be reference to this garden of eden place that was isolated in ice and i Mm -hmm. live on the east coast andy lives on the east coast the gulf stream keeps it nice and cozy up here still to this day so the gulf stream i think i've even seen something that showed how the gulf stream has been rerouted over the past couple hundred years so it's not in its original course but it used to make like what looks like an infinity loop like a figure eight in the atlantic Mm. ocean so if we're talking about like where iceland is and some people say that greenland used to be called iceland and iceland's really more green than greenland (laughs) is so they should call their greenland but you know what if you know, with less water, there was more land in that area or whoever, you know, as we were saying before with the continental continental drift, you know, it sounds to me like, again, same kind of argument with the Tartaria stuff. So people are coming at this information with flat earth in mind and figuring out a way to prove this into their flat earth model when really given the box saga model, it feels uh, like it's right at home or right in hell. (laughs) There's a lot of Occam's razor with, with studying the box saga. You take these very intense sci-fi fantastical ideas that we've garnered for good reason. In a lot of cases that we've had no good explanations for on a human level and brings it right back down to earth. In that context, you know, another sci-fi idea that kind of, I mean, it's not perfect, but it, it's into what scientists say now. <laughs> it, they say, according to saga history of human evolution, which dates to the first seed of life on this earth, the seeds grew and evolved to a point where eels formed. Eels then gave rise to frogs, which eventually evolved into monkeys. At some point, the genetics of the monkey and the goat became or combined to create the first two humans. Kind of going back a little bit in reverse to what you were talking about before, but yeah. sounds very scientific Eel. to me. I mean, it's not perfect because I think there's probably a couple steps in between frog and monkey and <laughs> eel and frog for sure. But it is, you know, if we looked at on an anatomical level, 
you're talking about, you know, an eel, which is, I'm pretty sure, not a vertebrae or an invertebrae. I don't know if they have a spine or not. I could be totally wrong. But then no. you have a frog, which has a spine, but mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it's not totally like a monkey's spine. So you're kind of seeing the evolution of this anatomical structure in a way. And also maybe, you know, they didn't have all the animals that Darwin did you know, in their books to fill in the blanks to this degree that we have with modern day science. But even that, you know, it's, it's not perfect. The, the, the evolution. Think about eel too, and how that's spelled. It's E E L right. L and L is Lord. Right. So you have an eel and then even an L, which is about what you're about to smoke right there. <laughs> it's uh looks like a little, little sperm dinghy. <laughs> yeah. you know it's an L smoking an L indeed yeah I never thought of that, that is, I, I always <laughs> thought that came from uh, that guy rapper Big L I, I had, uh, for some reason I thought that's where that came from but it's probably not know. that I at all no idea, dude. I don't I'm not sure I thought it is because it looked like an L just because it was a straight line or whatnot. but anyway yeah I was told it was the way like you roll it i'm like that's not you can roll those any way you want <laughs> <laughs> well moving back here we it's have skip further in no it's all right <laughs> we have we have some more to get into here with the box saga so have you guys gone through the whole box saga on the show yet and i'm sorry i haven't listened to no that question the answer to it or not but have you guys listened or like done a whole like covering of the topic or told people where to go to get that yeah we've definitely pointed people in the right direction we definitely talk a lot about different segments of the plot it's as if our audience is forced to kind of like they're going off into party and doing something else and coming back in and seeing part of the movie and the, because there's just so much of it it's hard to tell the whole thing back to front. Even Michelle Merle says that, you know, there really is no beginning and no end. The, the, the historical points, you know, we can definitely get into more of those. I'm sure we can get into all kinds of our, well, I just you know, wanted to ask ideas. just to make sure we weren't like repeating stuff. You already recorded, you know, if we go yeah. through this, cause I have, I sent the link in the chat, but I have this kind of, I am, I assume this is what Yake would have like, dedicated to memory um, or at least some of it but the one point that i wanted to point out on trees being regarded as sacred have you guys touched on this yet you're probably aware no but, we haven't uh, touched on it well we I, haven't really gotten focused on it no no okay well let me bring this up for your sake and the listener's sake i remember learning about something and it was vaguely druid they were saying this is a mm -hmm. druid thing but i mean kind of seems more like a box saga thing that each tree in ancient times had its own musical note associated with it. And each musical mm -hmm. note created a different tone, right? That tone created the letter and that's how they formed this original alphabet using the trees. And I'm seeing here that, you know, the Oak and the ash tree are kind of special in the box saga. They say the ash tree, maybe got its name because when a person died, they were cremated and their ashes went into this type of tree. Uh, and then the soul was then able to be absorbed by the roots ascending through the tree trunk branches and leaves to leave this planet whole kind of similar to how you put with the earth, right? Like you go through the roots of the earth through its trunk and then out the branches and the t other side. Yeah. And if you know anything about the goddess Asherah from the biblical perspective, she was represented as like a wooden statue or, or a, like a pole, a totem pole. Wow. And that was Asherah. And so, so yeah, you kind of get that symbology from there too. Right. We mentioned Oko being the, the male figure in box saga that it's responsible for lineage and the, the family tree. And the oak tree is yeah central to box saga in that respect that the family has a physical tree as well that represents everything where their ashes go. And possibly and I, even where we get the name occult. Occult. And the thing, the story in the box saga oak is cult. that yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oko occult. So, yeah. <laughs> go on, go on, Andy. I'm sorry. Yeah, to cut you well, off. just a real no, not just to to further our assessment uh, of the Catholic Church. The story goes that the Catholic Church literally came and destroyed this Boxstrom family tree, and that I believe mm-hmm. uh, we are had there are pictures of the root of that tree up on up on a hill. Now, is this the tree that had a chamber going underneath it into the ground? I remember that being a part of what Jim was talking about, that there was some sort of chamber that they unearthed somewhere in Finland. The Lemminkainen Temple. Mm. That's the Lemminkainen, yeah. Yeah, which is so not another connected. whole <laughs> aspect, <laughs> super connected, and another whole aspect to the saga, honestly. But, but back to what you were saying, sadly, his tree was cut down. Right. And think about the symbology of the tree getting cut down. Where else have we heard that in history? We've heard that in George multiple Washington. places. Bingo. And of course, we look at that as a national moment in history. You know, it's it's this cutting of the cherry tree. And, and you know, the further we look into that, I'm sure we can find yeah. you know, an opposing about, story like, the red of what that meant. The trees and, and, you know, these tall giants that lived in the Americas and then getting rid of all of these giants that kind of go back to this time period is, is getting rid of all the remnants of this old civilization. Families getting rid of these family trees, not only just symbolically, but literally. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And considering that cherries are a stone fruit adds another level of interest (laughs) to it for those like me who are fascinated by all these stone monuments that they left over and maybe even the stone monuments that George Washington found and and helped cover up. But yeah, wow. Yeah, it's cherry, eh? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, don't let me get distracted on this cherry tree Wikipedia page all the time. And that's the thing, a lot of our distractions lead to interesting finds. Right. Well, that's why Especially I, with the language. That's why I love having you guys here because as you guys talk, I'm just like duck, duck, go, googling things, and I'm like <laughs> that's oh. what this does, man. Yeah, it inspires yeah. you to start looking at your own damn language and the words you use. Exactly. Well, I mean, and of course, we've had that for a couple of years in the truth community where people have gone around and talk about word magic. It's just like the tip of the tongue, right there. But when you really get into it, puns turn out to be like the ultimate bastard stepchild. I mean, they are not just a mocked form of humor, but they are like at the root of understanding like why things are called certain things. It's nuts. Right. Right. Well, let's get into this lemon kind of temple. If we could a little bit, I'm sure you guys are going to do a whole episode on it at some point, but Mm. Uh, They say in paradise times, in every generation, the people came together to reconnect to the ring of sounds and knowledge to further their love and understanding. With them, they brought their finest arts and crafts, much of which was in the form of gold. Gold was honored because of the fire of the sun is within and it lasts forever. This was a giving to Yehovah, another important word in this whole cycle you know that's funny because the whole exodus yeah. of the of moses and them you know worshiping jehovah what if they <laughs> came from this place instead you know that's what i say is that ea and key mm. and and pata are said to be the same person and if you go with pata it turns into peter it turns into jupiter it turns into jehovah it wow. turns into yes Yah. yes yes Damn. Notice how we're taking good guys and bad guys and putting them in a blender and the dualities are falling apart. Well, and that's the thing that happens, though, is you see over time as cultures war with each other and fight for territory, the stories take the, the you know, take the sort of fall in the sense that they remain, but the characters are described differently as the victors, you know defeat each other right like so you know somebody loses and all of a sudden their hero is the villain for a couple hundred years and then those guys lose and then that guy becomes a hero for you know it it just cycles and cycles and cycles yeah we're in the midst of one of them (laughs) right and it's funny i was just listening to uh bill cooper a youtube interview it says he was interviewed by cnn i don't know 
I don't know. But look this up, folks. Go look up William Cooper interviewed by CNN. I don't know if that was actually CNN. But he's sitting in a living room talking about his his experiences for like two hours. And when he's he's getting into secret societies, he talks about how the Atlanteans, you know, did this all already. And he's like, you know, this is just repeating history, you know. And those are that's those Bill Cooper's words. I wonder if he was aware of all this stuff and if he was maybe he would have uh, mentioned it so get into the the religious aspect and the split a little bit because i've been kind of talking about this on shows lately because i just listened to the bhagavad vita on audio and there's a lot of stuff i i was didn't realize it before i was getting into it because a part of the box saga says that like the first place that raw went after he left the north or the arctic was hindustan and that's where you get all these different stans pakistan uzbekistan whatever stans uh, this whole hindustan area was like all of these different lands and this is where like the whole hindu religion comes from right and vishnu we talked about the v you see the v and in in there it talks about vishnu is all encompassing he encompasses the sun and the moon the good and the evil all aspects of humanity all aspects of life is encompassed then you go a little further and it says buddhism comes out of hinduism and they kind of take away all that and they put it all on the self and then you talk about christianity or catholicism and they talk about jesus and when you have and jesus possibly went and learned from buddha and then you have this duality. Now it becomes good versus bad in that um, aspect. So you you can kind of see how these different things came from possibly the Hindus and spread out everywhere else. We do have that connection between the Aryans and that area of the world as well so yeah yeah I think it again goes back to something I was saying earlier where you have these multiple stages of races if you will Mm -hmm. of the human species that kind of come at different time periods you know this isn't something I've come up with This is something you could find from numerous different researchers and they all say that this is part of Some story, and I wonder if it connects to the Bach saga explicitly, but yeah. I asked Yake about the word Rastafari, Mm. and he says it's about Ra in the far land. Interesting. And, you know, the Ethiopian, I forget what their proper name is, but this church, you know, this Ethiopian Christian group they're said to have parts of the bible that other groups you know Mm -hmm. left out and you know possibly the ark of the covenant went down there so there's a lot of strange stuff with ethiopia and and people who maybe don't know why i brought that up the rastafari's are connected to ethiopia hale selassie was like the Mm -hmm. leader of ethiopia for some time and ethiopia is you you know one of the only african nations that's never been colonized and a very interesting some of their like temple structures are carved into the ground like literally like stone stone and they carved inside of it like a like a pit and then like there's just a beautiful building like from this pit whatever was was left i don't know it's very strange it's unlike anything you see it in other places in the world also yeah. patwa the dialect that is spoken is a masterful like purposeful coding of the english language mm. because it is english it's just completely coded i believe the story was that it was enslaved people trying to come up with a way for their slave owners not to know what they were saying but that's flimsy i'd have Mm. to look further into it but if you guys are familiar with patwa a great reference is the movie shot us which is like a rastafarian gangster movie but you watch it with subtitles and you're like oh this is english this is just a coded version of english so there's some masterful linguists that came from that root that society in in itself yeah and when you look at what the Rastafarians believe right is all one world one love it's all encompassing everything which is yeah right 
Well, I kind of strayed a little bit away from the lemon Canaan yeah. temple here, but that no, first right. that first paragraph, you know, led us in so many different directions. So I it's definitely <laughs> appreciate it. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not disappointed that we did that. But lemon Canaan was the name given to Bach, the breeder. Lemminkainen Temple was created in honor of the Bach in an area known as Tuna inside of Udenma. So Tuna is interesting, obviously the fish, but a shout out to our homie Tuna in the Telegram chats and on the Patreon. And mm-hmm. also Atun, right? You get attuned, right? Yeah. That kind of yes. comes to mind, attunement. And then it's funny, you look at the root word, I went in Wikipedia, this of the word Tuna that, you know, is used to describe the this fish. It comes from they say in ancient Greek thunus, which is derived. It means like thino to dart along. But then uh, in the second paragraph, it says that another source in English is Spanish, which is atun. Right. So the Spanish version of this fish is atun. It's very mm. interesting that they called, you know, those. Things. It's not really related to the temple, but back to the temple. <laughs> but it's yeah. also interesting that they, you know, fit, being a fisherman, in, it has probably been a tradition in that area too for thousands right. and thousands of Sardinia. years. Sardinia, right. Sardinia. Well, then also the the fortuna, fortune, fortune, right? And and like fortune. if you're a fortunate, mm-hmm. you know, fisherman, maybe it's because you got a bunch of tuna that day. But yeah, so they were the, thinking about that too again in the thinking about tune and fortune if you're in tune and you're synchronizing with with the world then your fortune comes to you more easily right i mean you can exactly kind of uh go on that with the scene aspect that you you know the show that you do Thank you. Shout out. Yeah. Synchro Mystic Exploration of the Ever Expanding now has has its home on the Patreon. We actually took a little bit of a hiatus because it's so cold out, but you're giving me <laughs> yeah. an opportunity to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about it. The plan is to do instead of interviews, because I already do so many interviews, we're going to do like basically on the ground, feet on the ground investigation. So the first is available on uh, Rockfin. It's kind of, you know, rudimentary because we're just starting, but I investigated a little area in our area, this kind of place that has some history and a bunch of weird stone stones, stone stones. <laughs> so if that seems interesting to you, go to Rockfin and check out the scene. But yes, thank you, Dan. You never know what could happen when you get out there and uh, and you start looking for things. And I feel fortunate sometimes when I find Things that, you know, are worth putting in a little documentary. I don't know if it's a documentary, but that's kind of what I'm doing. Anyways, thanks for oh, yeah, le- thanks for letting me talk about that. The <laughs> Lion and Canaan Temple. Again, they brought all their art there, it seems. As a like, hey, look, let's all share. And they were known as the Artifacts. And it was created within a hill. The domed area at the top was used for ceremonies. Uh, Within this area is a golden spiral stairway, which leads to halls housing the artifacts. Each hall represents the lifetime of a Bach. In front of each hall stands a life-size golden statue representing the Bach at the age of 27, which is how old I am right now as we're recording this. And the temple became the mu si them the museum the museum is said to contain artifacts dating back to the beginning of human knowledge and it was closed in 987 ad due to the future invading christian armies and it was at that time permission was given to the remaining bach to reopen the temple 1000 years later in 1987 so this i feel like is uh, again, if we're going to bring the Tartaria stuff up, they always talk about, oh, there's this thousand year, you know, gap and all this stuff. I don't Mm -hmm. buy into that completely. I'm open minded to it. I find this point really fascinating because with this ancient history stuff, you usually don't see it connecting that recently. You know, we hear Mm -hmm. dates as far as like, you know, pre-Christ and even like further 10,000 plus years when we're talking about like the flood. But only a thousand years ago, this temple was closed. That's that's pretty awesome. 
I mean, it makes sense, though, that we would have these dark ages when these Christian armies are going through and destroying all of these, you know, seemingly intelligent cultures who were prospering or who were prosperous and making art, high art Mm -hmm. for that matter. Yeah. I know. I sometimes wonder about the Renaissance era too, because what does like Renaissance mean? It means like, doesn't it mean, uh, what's the definition of that word? I I don't want to speak stupid but i I think it's i'll I'll do do that for you don't worry dan let's see (laughs) renaissance uh the renaissance the i mean they're gonna tell us what the the period is but so it's a period in time but i want to find the the, what this word means so let me type in renaissance etymology because that usually gives us better results for this type of thing a little in shop Uh, type stuff here folks behind the scenes but um, as as you look that up, I'll, my speculation, and this has no bearing in anything. But so it's a revival. It means to revive, to revive classical right. based art. Right. So my speculation is that they found the temple and they took all this art mm. and they revived it and said it was theirs. Literally was rebirth actually is the like proper French meaning of the term. In old French, it means rebirth. So yeah. I think that's that's perfect, huh? I, I think that's I think that's a possibility. It might not be at all, and I might just be pulling on strings. But I, it's, I think it's kind of interesting. You know, that's their uh, typical behavior, and they do yeah. like to claim things as their own in that sense. Yeah. Well, and you look at the Renaissance period, and a lot of those people who were famous artists were also a part of these sort of guilds and secret societies that probably were just keeping all of that information secret because there was this big invasion of Christianity and fascism in the empire, you know? Yeah. Right. A lot of the secrecy, this is again, breaking down our dualities because not only the secrecy, but a lot of the inversion we're learning is, is honestly not necessarily mocking in the sense that we typically see it but it's even on our side of the fence the good guys you know trying to pass information the right way you know trying to get away with things by using inversion and stuff like that it's very weird yeah i think the the crusades happened like around the 1100s right i mean there's a huge dark age period around was 14 and 1500s and then, so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in history that kind of gets overlooked. We just go, oh, well, it was a, the church was doing it, so it's all good. Yay, God. <laughs> right. Right. And then, you know, backing up that kind of where we're going with this, they continue in this PDF saying, according to Eeyore Bach, there are other artifacts of the heathen culture buried in various locations across Finland, specifically there are three golden box statues. So clearly they're trying to hide this stuff to keep it safe. And then yeah, to if you c- listen to the Ananto episode, he says he was one of the researchers that did go to Kajani Castle mm. and he d- did some ground penetrating radar in the castle and they did find something buried deep within there with the ground penetrating radar. But when they gave money to the people that said that they would let them dig, the antiquities people, they basically ended up just taking their money and then telling them no, that they couldn't do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. So now yeah. researchers are flat broke. Yeah, no they, evidence. they refuse permission to excavate. And it's interesting. It says here that Kajani Castle is the oldest and most northern royal castle known in the world today. So it fits right in. It's yeah. 600 kilometers north of Helsinki. And and apparently Eeyore says it was the old breeding center thousands of years ago. Very interesting term. But to connect it to like, <laughs> go ahead, Dan, sorry. The breeding centers were mm. called Jerusalem. Really? Yes, they're Jerusalem. So I talked about this when we did when we interviewed Ari Asulin on our show because he brought up Jerusalem and I did a whole thing about it in the intro. But there are several Jerusalems all over the planet. And what's interesting about this area in the north in Helsinki area, there was a Jerusalem there that was right next to St. Petersburg or St. Peter's or something to do with St. Peter there. There's a a town in that area called St. Peter's. Wow. 
Very interesting. And then, you know, kind of connecting to a whole nother world is uh, it says that obviously the Bach family is symbolized by a goat. Oh, oh, we oh. touched on that. Oh, Go ahead, Dan. Sorry. 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 It's all right. Think about Petersburg, Peter, Pata, Berg, right? Iceberg, Petersburg. <laughs> Iceberg. Ooh. Interesting. I just, I just, that just popped up. That's why I was like, Ooh, hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder what that term iceberg, where the, the berg comes from with that, like what that actually comes from. Yeah, I don't bergy, know. Bergy bits. <laughs> That's what it says here. They're called growlers or bergy bits. Icebergs. Weird. I wonder oh, what really? That, yeah, well, let's, we'll, we'll dig into that, but I want to just bring this one point up and see what you guys have to say about well, Burr is like a thorn on like a rose, right? Mm. That's a uh, pokey. So if you have little ice things sticking up out of the water, that would be like a burr. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Like an ice burr. So an iceberg would be like little, cause icebergs are, are big giant ones that stick up out of the water like yeah. a thorn. Yeah. Or you, you're, when you're in an area, which has ice, you might say burr because yeah. you're cold, but yeah. Yeah, um, we're making revelations here. Oh yeah, <laughs> it all fits. So according <laughs> to what always happens when you start talking about things, dude, <laughs> and you just hear things like you just go, "Oh shit, that connects to that." Like it's it's hard to say like this connects to that, but when you actually see like the whole process of it happening, dude, it's like it's it's hard to say that it's just bull crap. You know, mm -hmm. agreed. Or coincidence. Yeah. Agreed, and there's you know. There's no shame in that here on the My Family Think Some Crazy podcast. It's it's the point. It's what we all come here for, to get away from those nonsense folks. And I, I dispel them. If they're listening, you know, they hear me, I'll say a little, you know, oh, just so you know, if you're if you're sensitive, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll make those clarifications. But don't worry, Dan, you're free to speak your truth here. But I need to hear your thoughts on the connection to King Arthur, because it talks about the regalia of the last king of the Asser, which to me sounds a lot like King Arthur. King Arthur is this big knight of the round table. We're talking about, you know, a round temple. We're talking about a round city. We're talking about, you know, yeah. northern kings. Wow. I mean, King Arthur, it seems like maybe I, there's a connection. I didn't even, I never really put it together before, but. You were talking about art earlier, right? The mm -hmm. AR, the R, the Arctic, and then you have it right there in Arthur to art. And they the even AR. talk about the court of Asser, which, you know, again, could be Arthur to some tongues, right? Because that's a big point in, in this root word stuff is that, you know, as languages evolve, the, the words kind of evolve with the people mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, certain words like s and t kind of have similar sounds right s th right so who knows maybe arthur connects to that because a lot of people talk about how you know it could be merlin and the druids that were sort of beaten up and kicked out by the romans and assimilated with but it seems to me like the druids were possibly just sort of like offshoots of this box society it just kind of seems like they fit this possibly, flavor yeah. you know well there's plenty of connections from you know we look at Odin Ma and these northern areas mm -hmm. over to Ireland yeah. because the, when we say all land ice, what they were specifically talking about were the lands, the Finland, you know, Ireland, Scotland, like all of these lands were what they were considering. England. So they, England. Yeah. That we, so we can, tr and of course, even mainstream history, we can trace a lot of Viking lore into Ireland and Scotland and, and how that all passed. Even my name, Rouse, we've, we've kind of traced back to a group that were known as the Reds, you know, coming into Ireland. A, a very interesting history behind it and how that's all connected in those lands. So they're mm. all together in this. You're kind of in the dark there, Andy. So it's hard to tell, but I'm pretty sure Dan and I have that red tinge in our beards. And oh, you I may do as too. well. Yeah. I do as well. <laughs> that yeah. is, that is, it seems like we're kind of all touching on something that we may be ancestrally, ancestrally connected to. Cause I myself have 
you know, mix of Irish, Scottish, French, and all that, you know, yep. Northern mix, you know, that most of us New Englanders get. But even Dan, all the way out there on the West Coast is kind of... My a, family's from Boston. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Look at that. So, yeah, yeah I, I told think... told Andy that before. Uh, I went to... Uh, family reunion out in Boston because most of my family all comes from there. My mom and her mother, my mom was born in Massachusetts. And Mark and I have talked about with a couple other New England podcasters about getting into some of the areas up in, uh, I know of Massachusetts has one in Upton, Massachusetts, which is suspected to be connected to druidic construction and chambers. stuff like that. Yes. And so there's a lot more than that. I'm, Mark, I'm sure you're familiar with all the the stone walls that are throughout the New England forests that are claimed to be loosely that they're property markers from colonists, but that has been refuted mm. many, many times. Now, and these structures come from much older societies here. Yeah, maybe and I... This gets into Tartaria a little bit because the people that came to America first were these Arctic people, Possibly, and they're the ones teaching the, the Native Americans how to, you know, shoot bows and everything, and all this other stuff, and and then so then when you get like this new kingdom that came here, which is the Catholic Church, and then they kind of take over, you know, through the they take over the Freemasons, they take over all these other aspects, and then and the Illuminati starts in the same same year i think is the declaration of independence got done and then you have this total fucking takeover and it goes the other way and then everybody just blames that original people for that but because even when i talked to yake george washington was working with the the i don't know what that's called but basically the king and person of sweden yeah there you go vasa yeah and they and he was the that guy was giving them money to to start colonizing america and then you have these people uh, they probably got word that they came out here and then they came and met them out here and then hence what the civil war possibly really was oh <laughs> yeah and even like earlier conflicts that are kind of you know not as talked about 1812 and you know there was some wars between russia and other countries in that time period as well so yeah, that yeah, French Revolution. Yeah, yeah in mm. and France as well. I was thinking about how you know France owned a large swath of the United States for some time. I mean, maybe there's a, a connection. Maybe they yeah. were maybe they were like you know taking over some of these Tartarian buildings. That's why it's not in our American history. And then when it was sold to you know the Americans, it was kind of mm. like oh yeah, all of this stuff was already you know, worked through by the French. So the people who yeah. took it over were like, oh yeah, the French built this. When meanwhile, mm -hmm. it was Tartarian, you know, I don't, just a little more speculation to throw in the pot, but. Uh, yeah, I would agree. We did the Tartaria uh, group show and uh, I was the only one that said that, like, I think that the mud flood happened uh, a lot earlier in history. Everybody else thought about the 1800s, but mm. I think it happened a lot earlier and that these, because you have native American stories that talk about these structures already being there. And they said that they just stayed away from them because it's, you know, where the giants were at. And so they just kind of stayed away. They didn't really go to them. They didn't regard them at all. They just kept away from them. So you already have this kind of these structures already being there when the Indians were around. Right. Hmm. And you have these sort of plantation <clears throat> buildings that supposedly the Cherokee had ownership of somehow, even though they didn't build them. And it, I don't know if it's clear who built them. So, yeah, there's a lot of cases where buildings get occupied afterwards. And that was a big question for me going into this a couple months ago. It's like, well, if these buildings were here, why don't we have stories from Native Americans and them interacting with them? Obviously, they had their own way of building structures and they were kind of living a more nomadic lifestyle anyways didn't seem to fit their lifestyle to just like take over and squat in some stone you know monumental building that probably the doors were way larger than you know them or maybe you know just didn't fit for whatever reason or it was halfway sunken in mud so they couldn't like enter the building maybe besides through a window or something who knows yeah 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 i i definitely i'm i'm more in the side of thinking like 
this thing is is more older than more recently because and this is something Greg actually said on his most recent episode of the Higher Side Chats interviewing Ben Stewart, a filmmaker, and they were talking about the mud flood and Greg was like, Well what if this ice movement that Randall Carlson is tracking was actually mud? I mean and that happened, I don't know how many years ago, but you see these sort of diagrams of what happens to buildings when you put a certain force and the ground is a certain you know, level of density and the buildings just sink right into the mud, you know? So, faction. Yeah. Right, right. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting. It's definitely. But however, I would say that I've had some, the so Russ and Kyle Allen of the, uh, Brothers of the Serpent podcast. I'm not sure if uh, you guys know those guys, but they they work with Randall on the Cosmographia podcast. And what, when I asked them about the mud flood idea and liquefaction, they said that those buildings would not only, you know, sink into the ground, but all of it would be in thousands of pieces. And those buildings would be annihilated from the liquefaction itself too. So I'm not sure how many people are, are throwing that idea in there because that does throw That's a, a great pretty point big to wrench make. In, in that yeah. idea, you know, yeah. they said that n- the structures would just topple and just, and just completely dismantle themselves. Right. But I don't know. Right. Well, I mean, unless we're talking about the type of uh, building that we see in the megalithic structures where, you know, you have a a large, you know, sufficiently large enough stone. But again, I I trust their their opinion on that because they do look into a lot of that stuff. But it's also said in Box Saga that they were aware of the Christians coming around and destroying all of their stuff. And so what they did is they purposely buried Mm. um, their relics so that the Christians couldn't find them and destroy them. Right. Right. And that's, that's where we were kind of going towards with this line in this lemon kind. Yeah. 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 (laughs) It's the lemon (laughs) kind. Yeah. Lemon (laughs) kind. Yes. Isn't there a beer Uh, called like Lennon Kugel or something like Lennon Kugel? Yeah. yeah. That's it. It's interesting that they do that. They kind of take take the mind away from deeper truths by naming things. Like you see that. I don't have any good examples off the top of my head, but but yeah, I just that's, explain it all away. Yeah, you know, I, I th- you know it's a familiar. This is way off topic, but just recently I remember hearing Trump freak out about them tearing down a Columbus statue, and it's like in one vein, yeah, destroying history is definitely a problem and it's ridiculous. So you get everybody rallying about that, but you get them rallying about a fake part of history to keep that intact, and it's just so funny. I know it's a little off topic. No, no, it's same, it's same kind of principle, you know. It's not. Like, it's we'll not too far this. off topic. I mean, the whole Columbus thing fits right into the American rewritten history narrative, right. and and he became like this big Italian a symbol of Americanism during the 1900s when a lot of people from Europe were immigrating here, and Italians had a lot of communities so they rallied around Columbus and that's why there was a Columbus statue in New Haven that got taken down around the whole social justice warrior freak out about anything commemorating a time in history when things were you know like that but yeah I'm definitely not a, a Columbus apologist I don't give a shit that the 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 statue got taken down. But what I am grateful for is the fact that I took a picture of the statue before it got taken down, because I think the real reason why they were like, yeah, take them down is because they know folks like us are out here and we're not all uh, figuring it out, you know, 100% of the time, but they don't want as much evidence out there now with these public structures because guys like Ross Ben, you know, have decoded all of the artwork in Philadelphia, right? And like, mm-hmm. maybe they didn't want somebody to come along and figure out what that Columbus statue was really mm-hmm. encoding, right? Because he had right. a, a compass in his hand, a globe in his hand, and a scroll in his pocket. So he was definitely, there was some symbols on that statue for sure. Absolutely. And then you got I the other side that. keeping that fake history, trying to keep that fake history alive, you know? Right. I thought about this recently too, because you you brought up Ross Ben and Michael Wan, the 40th parallel. I'm wondering if there's possibly some connection with the 30. We know about the 33rd parallel, but and the 40th now. But what what my wondering is, I guess, is maybe that these were the different 
rings, the different ring lands, and these were like different caste systems, and this, these civilizations existed on this ring around the planet or this latitude line, and these different caste systems were building these different structures, and that's why you get a, a little bit of a variation between like the pyramids and the ziggurats and the Mayan temples and everything like that because they're slightly different but using the same technology. And I'm wondering if, if that maybe has something to do with the whole caste system, mm. even in India, because we're talking about how they first went to India or Hindustan. They had like a caste system there and it's just now starting to kind of go away, you know? Right. Well, to the best of my knowledge, and I've been studying this for a few months now, ley lines Dragon lines, or maybe the more unanimous scientific term, geomantic or telluric currents, right? They're basically passing energy like this, you know, wire system almost within the planet. And the energy is either positive or negative. It's all based on, you know, what's being done in this area. So I think at a certain time, maybe these parallel lines or just the ley lines themselves were activated with certain structures to, you know, create mm -hmm. a good energy. Who knows if that, you know, was a border or whatever, but it seems like now the energy is very, <laughs> very negative that's being this passed a, along these lines. Yeah, you know, this is another thought too. Maybe it was like acupuncture because mm, the world was in right. such turmoil. They're trying to do like hit these acupuncture points of the of the world to keep it from doing all these catastrophes all the time because it was a very chaotic castro castrophytic world and they wanted to try to simmer down the earth right mm. yeah so lemon kind of <laughs> i know dude we've been trying to talk about lemon kind for an well hour. it kind of fits into everything we we're talking <laughs> yeah. about because it was buried uncovered and i feel like you know it was probably covered up again, but by a different group of interests rather than maybe the people who were working to preserve it the first time it got reburied or dismissed uh, mm -hmm. by the traditional academic, right? Is that, is that what well, happened or? Well, what Dan's suggesting too, that it may have been broken into and, and the artifacts stolen is a real, real damaging point too, because the excavations are still going on right now, trying to, get in there to prove all of this. And so, my God, that would, that would be terrible if they got in there and it was all empty and it, you know, had, but I mean, I guess they would still be evidence of something in there perhaps. Or maybe they, they kept some artifacts from there and they took them out and put them in different places. Hence like the different box statues that they put in different castles because sure. they, they didn't want to keep everything and all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you have certain parts of civilization that are holding on to these relics. I mean, even in like the medieval times, they always talking about going and finding these different relics in different places and maybe that has something to do with that fact that that there was people that were holding on to them and keeping them for keepsakes and then they were getting stolen and repurposed by other people claiming that they were theirs or or whatnot i mean even in uh, the world war ii era you saw hitler uh, first stop uh taking the spear of destiny from the the museum and whatnot so i mean you have all you have this going on throughout history so maybe these relics were leftover things from the the arctic times or from atlantis yeah. and they were just holding on to them and not necessarily that they were able to raid Lemminkainen Temple, but these artifacts already pre-existed. And maybe they were just repurposing them or re-imaging them or, or just copying them completely. Mm -hmm. One way or the other, the excavations currently mm -hmm. going on year after year, it's still being privately funded, but I know that they... They always need more money. I've actually been thinking that, that we should start some sort of, you know, GoFundMe for them to help them carry on the work. You yeah. know, it's been thwarted. It's been stopped. It's been, you know, COVID mishandled. Shut it down. COVID shut it down bef way before that. Uh, you know, a sting happened. And I think it, it seemed like a third party got involved that wasn't close to Eeyore that they became friendly with. And he ended up bringing a lot of
lot of legal trouble down on them through drugs and, and other things. And they all went to jail at one point. So things have been occurring over time to kind of pause and stop and slow down the process of this excavation. And uh, with more funding, I think that they would be, because they know what they want to do and what they need to do. It's just the funding that's so difficult. Mm. So right now, Michelle Merle, Merle talks about how they're uh, in the process of beautifying the outside of it to try to bring it back to what it may have been like in earlier times when it was more of a traditional place. So to bring more positive attention towards it, possibly more funding. Right. Now, I know this might be unrelated, but have you guys looked into the Bach Tower in Florida at all? Have you heard of this or seen no, this? I have not heard of it. Okay, so I'm going to pull it up for the screen <laughs> share. So there's this strange <laughs> stuff. Bach Tower in Florida, and it was kind of built by like some wealthy folks. Let me find their name. A strange guy, as a matter of fact, someone who kind of screen shared so you guys can see. Think, Edward actually, W. Bach, a Dutch-born American yes. editor Pulitzer surprising author, this. and he was the editor of the Ladies' Home Journal for 30 years. I don't know, there might be some predictive programming there yeah. uh, affecting the women of America at a very interesting time. We see what's happened since. But yeah, he was around from 19, let's get a really good biography going here. Roman sent this article to me and I, I read it and I, I checked out the area and there's some interesting names of different places in the area, too. Mm. Yeah, he was born in uh, 1863 and died in 1930. So close to maybe close to the Bach saga, right? Because if Eeyore Bach was the last uh, one of the last inheritors and he was born probably what uh, around this the time this guy died. I mean, I'm not saying that this guy was related, but uh, it is strange that he built this tower. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not even screen sharing it. Hold on. So the pictures are kind of crazy considering what we're talking about here. Oh, and yeah. It looks, looks very a bit like a cathedral. Look at, yeah. Look at the like the women like circling the inside. They're like almost like a crown, right? You see how they yeah. look like saints or, or angels or something. You yeah. the tree symbolism along the side. Mm -hmm. Tree of life. And then, you know, very. And it's very phallic. Yeah. yeah. It's almost Overall. like an obelisk. But yeah, yeah and it has I'm a reflecting some pool too, as well. Mark. It's pretty impressive, this whole garden area. You, yeah. If one of you want to go on there and, and look up the area of Florida, like as a map, you can see some different rivers and city names that are interesting also. Look at the fairy garden right next door. Yeah. <laughs> well, clearly there's a lot to get into here. And <laughs> you're just at the beginning of it with Roots That's of Creation. But, you know, you both have your own shows that are in the, I mean, definitely close to the hundreds in, in uh, Dan's case. But I think you're past 100 episodes, right, Andy? Right. No, man, I'm I'm way low. I'm, well, you guys got there. plenty of content for folks to yeah. get into, is yeah. my point. So tell us about <laughs> the shows you do. And then obviously what we're talking about today is a big part of your new show, Roots of Creation, right? So tell us where we can find your shows and let us know what to look forward to in the in this next year, 2022. We're just kicking it off. Yeah, man. I'm Andy Rouse. I'm at the Deep Share. That's where you can find most of my content where I do a lot of interviews and uh, I'm starting up a premium channel, which is going to be focusing more on psychedelics and near death experiences, things like that called The Witness. I guess I can announce it now. My wife and I are also starting a little premium show too, dealing with healing deep healing and how and what the journeys that we've been on and we've been doing so you can look forward to that as well i also do worship in the storm with emmanuel kingman every other friday at nine on uh, youtube eastern time and we just get into all kinds of weird spiritual talk on that show and it's cool because Manuel and i come from different perspectives but we're you know, he's always teaching me so much and showing me new ideas about the way i think too so that's a that's a fun time but yeah that's where you can find me and then roots of creation of course what we're what we're really working on right now right on yeah and where can they find those premium channels andy <laughs> 
Well, they don't, the premium channel doesn't exist yet, but it will be coming probably next month. But you can find me at the deep share on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, that's where you can find my RSS feed and, and my YouTube channel. And that's where all those guys are. Okay. So those aren't going to be like a Rockfin show? The premium side might be. I haven't really worked out what I'm going to do with Rockfin yet. I, okay. I, I've prematurely announced that I'm on there, but I don't have any content up, but I'll figure it out sooner okay. or later. Okay, cool. Very cool. Yeah, Everybody so will know. I'm watching out for The Witness. I want to hear some more of that. I am a Dan Unaki Dan, and I have a show called Rising from the Ashes, and we, we're actually on only at like episode 42 or 43. We have about 55 episodes or so on, on the feed. Roman and I are kind of branching out this year. We're gonna, we have a Patreon set up, so go check out our Patreon. I am going to be doing two solo shows a month on there, and Roman also is going to be doing two solo shows a month on there. Mine is called uh, Devil's Advocate. I'm going to be talking to people about spirituality, religion, and paranormal. Andy was my first guest. Roman will be the second guest. And uh, Roman has a show called Expanded Understandings. And he's talking about occult symbolism and healing modalities with plant medicines and stuff like that. And then also we're doing uh, four shows a month on a regular feed with a group show at the end. And uh, hopefully I would like to be doing a premium group show just for Patreon with some other people in the podcast realm. So if other podcasters hear this and want to get in on that, that'd be fucking awesome. Mark, I want you to be a part of that also. I know you have a Patreon and a dedicated following. So it'd be cool to have like a Patreon group show where we can all hang out and talk whatever we want. Kind of like uh, what is it? Union of the unwanted, but for premium uh, subscribers too. And then, you know, whoever subscribes to that premium show, whether it's yours or ours, or if Andy gets one, it'll be on all of our feeds and they can see it there. Cause a lot of time when we do swap casts, we, everybody puts out the episodes. Yeah. And so like a premium wanna... swap cast. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd be down to do that. And I saw your, your message about that, but yeah. Awesome guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge about the box saga and the ancient strange origins of mankind bringing up a lot of questions, leading people to find their own answers, I hope. And I hope that leads them to your shows. Obviously, you guys all just heard where you can listen to both of these gentlemen. You can find both their podcasts on altmediaunited.com as well. All the links are there. Uh, The Deep Share podcast and Rising from the Ashes. As far as my family thinks I'm crazy is concerned, we love you. We thank you for being dedicated, as Dan pointed out. And have a great moment wherever you are in the now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking with me here in the extended outro. And it is late. I am editing these episodes way past midnight. So I'm just going to keep this real short and tell you, you can support the show and keep this train on the tracks by going to patreon.com and signing up. That monthly fee helps me pay for hosting, the Zoom calls, the music, and everything else that goes into Uh, living a life and making a podcast Uh, we also have some really awesome new t-shirt designs if you go to our link tree or if you go to the link in the description of this episode in your podcast app go and check those out for 20 bucks you can get a t-shirt and represent and let the world know that your family thinks you're crazy if you like heady wraps we got those too go over to the link tree there's a link to the store Kofi store has all of our artwork shout out to Kurt he just ordered a wrap shout out to everybody who's leaving us messages we appreciate it send us some messages in the telegram leave a voice message if you want to be heard on the show that's right I'll play your message here in the extended outro and give you a response on the air Uh, you can also email me at mfticpodcast at gmail.com or you can follow us on Instagram either way works and be sure to leave us five stars and a review let us know why your family thinks you're crazy or tell us why you love the show either way we appreciate you so much for listening thank you so much to andrew and dan for joining me be sure to follow them at their own podcast the deep share podcast for andy and the rising from the ashes podcast for dan and obviously of course roots of creation right the 
podcast we talked a lot about today, just getting off the ground with their friend Yakim, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us. Either way, shout out to everyone who has joined the Patreon recently. If I haven't said your spirit animal names in an extended outro yet, I will. Just gotta double check and make sure I didn't already. Like I said, it's pretty late. Not gonna do it here. Uh, But either way, this one's short, so I'm going to put a little clip from Jim Chesner, one of the last videos he did. talked a little bit about him today, and sadly, he has passed away uh, in the past few years. So rest in peace, Jim Chesner. I just want to say thank you for putting all that information out there. Uh, That's how I first heard the box saga from Jim himself, so... Be sure to go over to the YouTube and check out all the different information you can find on Jim there. He's got a bunch of talks that he did while he still was alive, and he's been on multiple podcasts as well. So if you want to learn more about the box saga, that's a great place to go. And obviously, uh, Dan and Andy know that there's so much more that Jim couldn't mention, and that's the point of the show, Roots of the Creation. They're going to Get down to the bottom of it all and sort it all out and connect with other interesting people who are looking at this same story. How neat is that? So enjoy this clip, one of Jim Chesner's last videos, I think the last video he put out, and uh, enjoy the moment wherever you are in the now. Thank you to everyone supporting the show. We can't do it without you. We love you so much. And if you need a new podcast, go over to altmediaunited.com. We got it all going on over there. And let us know what you think in the Telegram. All the links are in the description. Peace. There are two main theories about how this universe came into existence. The first theory is the Big Bang Theory. That one night, nothing exploded, and bingo, there were a million somethings. How can something come from nothing, and how can nothing explode? There's no logic to the Big Bang. The number two theory is the God theory. One night, an invisible man up in the freezing vacuum of outer space somewhere just decided to make it all in six days. Where did he come from and where did he get the material to make a billion stars with? There's no logic with that one either. At best, the God theory is an abstract concept. However, the Vox Saga gave us a third option called the eternal universe theory. The universe has always been and the universe will always be. It had no beginning, and it will have no ending. The light has been forever, and the light will be forevermore. This is called eternity, or eternal, with no beginning and no ending. When one looks out into the stars, into the night sky, those beautiful stars, they go forever, and ever and ever and ever with no end. And this is called infinite. The stars, the universe, there is no end to the universe, it's forever. One verse, one universe, not multi. Universe in itself is the always. It is forever. It is the never ending. It is the eternal. And it is the infinite. It doesn't need, it does not need a creator or a creation to exist. It's always been and will always be. And because the light is forever, light can go on forever and ever and ever. And this is the eternal universe. No beginning and no end, it's forever. I just wanted to put that in there like that, an explanation of the universe. Also, 
There's one sun, there's one moon, and there's one planet. And all those stars are made of metal, ice, and gas. They're not made of nuclear fusion or burning. They're made of three materials that reflect the light. And when the straw of the sun leads from the sun and goes in every direction, constant, these light rays, these straws, they go forever. The farthest star you can see out in the universe, the sun will shine past that star. So when this light leaves the sun, this straw goes out three light years, 15 light years, 600 light years, a thousand light years. This ray of light can come and hit one of these things we call stars made out of metal, ice, and gas. And there the light can't go through the star, so it reflects back to us here on the planet. So everything we see in the universe is a reflection of Udin, the sun. If the sun, Udin didn't shine, the stars wouldn't shine, this earth would be completely dark and black, Mars wouldn't shine, Venus wouldn't shine, the moon, there would be no light in the universe. And the sun has always been, and the sun will always be. And the sun is not a star. And the stars are not suns.